Open your Bibles to Mark chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 18. And the Bible says, And the disciples of John and of the Pharisees used to fast. And they come and say unto him, Why do the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them. And then shall they fast in those days. Well, it's important to understand a little bit what Jesus said about fasting. What I see in this is, once again, the religious people wanted to make a rule that in order to be holy, you had to fast. I did a little, a little bit of looking up of the word fast and fasting in the Bible where it's first used. I thought, well, surely it's designated in the law to do fasting. It's not. The first person it said in the Bible that did any fasting, it just mentions King David and some of his distresses and trials. It said that he fasted. Of course, you know what fasting is. It means to do without a meal or two or three while you pray. A lot of times it's used with the word prayer, fasting and prayer. But notice Jesus' attitude about it. He said, no, my disciples don't fast. They got a good right now. I'm here with them. They don't need to fast. But someday I'll be taken away. Maybe they'll fast then. The way I interpret that, and by the way, just to point out myself, my own personal testimony, I have never fasted in the way the Bible shows some people fasting. I've just never done it. And uh, I kind of look at it the way Jesus did. You know, why should I fast? I don't need to fast. I don't feel any compulsion to fast. There's nothing in the New Testament that tells me as a Christian I need to fast that I know of. And what it's really all about is, I think, what's going on is often fasting has to do with, if you read about it in the Old Testament, you'll see it mentioned quite a bit in the various prophets. It has to do with when things are really going bad, really going badly, and you're really suffering something. And you want to make sure that you're giving your full attention to the Lord, turning to Him and seeking Him. So you'll miss some meals in order to make sure that you're putting a spiritual emphasis on your relationship with the Lord and what you're seeking from Him. Now, you can do that without fasting. Jesus didn't fast. Why not? He didn't need to. He was able to stay close to God without fasting. Other people fast. What's up to you? The way I interpret that, it's up to you. If you think skipping a meal and praying is better for you spiritually, then you're free to do it. It's not a requirement. You're not commanded to do it, but you can do it if you want to. You can do whatever you want. You can skip TV shows. You can skip movies. You can skip your favorite entertainment. You can skip whatever you want in order to pray more. And you can skip meals in order to pray more. A lot of people in America should skip a few meals. <laughs> Might help them out a little bit. Might help their longevity on the earth. But the point, the, to me, the important point is there's no hard and fast rule in the Bible that to be a spiritual person you must fast. But you're permitted to if you want to. Enough said. Notice what Jesus says in verse 21 and 22. Too little parables, you might say, too little symbolism to teach a very important lesson. Jesus says in verse 21, No man also sews a piece of new cloth on an old garment. The new piece that filled it up taketh away from the old, and the rent is made worse. That's a simple illustration. I guess a seamstress understands what he's saying. If you have an old garment and you want to patch it, Jesus said, don't put a new patch on it. That would make it look bad. Because it would show the patch. My first uh, lesson that I learned as a little boy with patches was we used to have Levi's. 
And the Levi's would often wear out in the knees. In today's world, you'd be in style if that happened. You'd have a good style. But in my world, when I grew up, that was a bad, oh, you know, you got holes in your knees, you poor thing, you need a new pants. So they would buy, the, buy these iron-on patches and iron them on. That would last about two days, and then they'd start shriveling off. They looked horrible. And so Jesus was right. Things do not look good with patches, especially if you have an old garment with a new patch. Well, then he put the same lesson in verse 22 about putting wine into bottles, or I would say grape juice. And no man puts new wine into old bottles. In this context, I think he's saying grape juice. Else the new wine does burst the bottles, and the wine is spilled, and the bottles will be marred. But new wine must be put into new bottles. There's the key point. Don't mix the old with the new. That's the lesson. It's not really teaching about wine or grape juice or anything. What he's teaching is do not mix the old with the new. What do we have that's both old and new? Old Testament and New Testament. Don't mix the old with the new. But in order to understand that, don't mix the Old Testament with the New Testament. The New Testament came to replace the Old Testament. But wait, make sure you understand what I mean when I say Old Testament. Because there, there's two usages of the phrase Old Testament. One of the usages is from men. Human beings came up with it. And that is calling all of the books written before the Gospels the Old Testament. That is a human designation to call that the Old Testament. You won't find anywhere in the Bible that those books all together are called the Old Testament. You will find the phrase the Old Testament in the Bible, in the book of Hebrews. And what it refers to is the fact that the word testament means covenant. The Old Covenant. The Old Covenant is the law of Moses. The New Covenant is what Jesus brought instead of the law. Remember, Christians are told you're not under law. That means the law of Moses. But you're under grace. Where is the law of Moses? It's in what we call the Old Testament. But the Old Testament is made up of the first five books of the Bible. We call that the Pentateuch, the, book, the books Moses wrote. Then it's made up of historical books that tell us about King David and King Solomon, the downfall of Israel, the poetical books like Psalms and Proverbs, and the prophetical books, which actually has quite a few divisions. The law refers to the law of Moses that was given to him on Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments, and all the other commandments that were given to the Israelites through Moses, like dietary laws, laws on who would be put to death for this and who would be put to death for that, all kinds of, all kinds of laws and rules and commandments. That was the law. That was the Old Testament. The Old Testament was based on the concept, here's a whole bunch of commandments, people. Obey those commandments and you'll live. Disobey and you must die. For the wages of sin is death. That's the principle of the law. That's why the law condemns people. It can only condemn. The weakness of the law is human nature. It's a beautiful law. If anyone could keep that law perfectly, they'd be a perfect person. They'd be holy. There's nothing wrong with the law, except for the fact human beings can't keep it. Can't keep it. Except for Jesus. He's the only one that kept the law. Well, Jesus replaced the law with grace. That's why it says in John chapter 1 and verse 17, the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. The new covenant is Jesus will forgive you freely if you just believe in him. We already know you're a failure. You've sinned. And so the new covenant's much better. That works for human beings. Because any sinner can say, I admit that I'm a sinner. Please forgive me and save me, Lord Jesus. Anyone can say that and they get saved. So the new replaces the old. It's not mixed with it. One of the big problems in Christianity are people that teach new mixed with old. They'll put works into their explanation of salvation. Works do not go into salvation. They come after salvation. By grace are you saved through faith. 
not of works, lest any man should boast. So Jesus taught it clearly with those two examples. The new replaces the old. Remember, there's two meanings to the word Old Testament. One is from man, all of the books of the Old Testament. That's man's designation. And the other is from God, the old covenant that came through Moses. Well, then the next couple of examples in the life of Jesus, he's going to go about showing in his life how that he put aside the old and replaced it with the new. We'll get a little, we'll get a perspective of what that new is like compared to the old. So verse 23 says, And it came to pass that he went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day. And that's the key point. The Sabbath day. Where is the Sabbath day designated? The law. One of the Ten Commandments is that you would keep the Sabbath day, right? Honor the Sabbath day. No, actually, to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Remember the Sabbath day. So, keeping the Sabbath day is part of the law that Jesus just said would be totally replaced. Now he's going to show why. He's going to give a couple of examples here why. On the Sabbath day, they're out in a field getting food. That's what they're doing. Jesus and his disciples are out in a field plucking the ears of corn. Verse 24 says, And the Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? They're under the law. They're thinking law, law, law. And here, here's one of the problems with the Sabbath day. What did the Sabbath day? You shall do no work on the Sabbath day. Uh-oh, there's already a problem. Because who's going to define what's real work and what isn't? Who's going to define that? Well, they had some volunteers. They're called Pharisees. They volunteered to define what you could do on the Sabbath day and what you couldn't. So they ruled... They ruled their society, the religious leaders. It's not always good to have a religious world, a religious society, a religious nation. They had one. Didn't work out too well for them because they used the covenant of the law instead of the covenant of grace. And uh, so they told people what they could do and couldn't do. So they added to the law and twisted it, perverted it, made it worse than it was. But Jesus said in verse 25, Have you never read what David did? When he had need and was not hungered, he and they that were with him. I just read that the other day. Yesterday, I think it was. In 1 Samuel, I think it was around chapter 20, something like that. And uh, David being pursued by Saul, he's running out of food, he's hungry. He sees Abiathar the priest, and David realizes the priest has food. One of the things they do in the tabernacle at that time, there was no temple. One of the things the priests did, they baked bread every day. They put fresh bread in the temple. When they changed the bread, the bread that came out, the priest got to eat it. That was part of their food. But only the priest could eat it. That was in the law. The law of Moses gave those rules about that bread. And uh, David, King David, or soon to be King David, said, "I'm hungry. I want some of that bread. Give me some bread." And the priest did. And nothing in the Bible condemns him for doing that. And Jesus even says, "It's in the Bible. David did it, and it was against the law what he did. He broke the law. Why did he break the law? Because he was hungry, and there's bread there. That's why." And so Jesus said, that was fine for him to do it. I'm doing it too. I'm hungry and I'm out here getting me some food in the field. Don't tell me it's against the law. I'm the Lord of the law. I tell you what's permitted and what isn't. And I say it's permitted. And so he says in verse 27, one of the great statements about the Sabbath day, the Sabbath was not made for man, or the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. In other words, God gave a day of rest to benefit people. Once in a while you need a little rest. 
You know, once in a while, you need to sit back for 30 or 45 minutes. You know, some people take 24 hours, but other people take less than that. But once in a while, you need a little rest, and you get back to work. That was for man's benefit. It wasn't to limit man. It wasn't to condemn man. It wasn't to uh, come up with as many rules as you could as a religious people to control man. And also he said, as we pointed out in verse 28, Jesus said, Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. And so he's kind of, he's pointing out his authority. If King David, soon to be King David, could take the bread from the priest, King Jesus could take food out of a field. Well, there's, there's a very good example. But you know, it's, it's important to understand the Sabbath day, Sabbath day, Saturday, not Sunday, Saturday. The Seventh-day Adventists are right on that one point. They're wrong on we must have church services on Saturday. They're wrong on that because they're trying to, well, they're trying to keep the Sabbath, aren't they? And where's the Sabbath? It's in the law. We're not under law. By the way, Jesus rose from the dead on what day? Did he, ri did he rise from the dead on the Sabbath? No, he rose on Sunday, the first day of the week. And that's the reason that Christians most commonly have meetings on Sundays, commemoration of the day that Jesus rose from the dead, and avoiding the Sabbath day to show we're not under law. So another misuse of a Bible term over the history of the human race, many, many, many Christians have called Sunday the Sabbath day. It's not the Sabbath day. It's not the Christian Sabbath day. There is no Christian Sabbath day. Sabbath is part of the law and it's Saturday. Oh well, another lesson. Another lesson about the Sabbath day, chapter 3 and verse 1. And he entered again into the synagogue. And there was a man there which had a withered hand. A withered hand, maybe he was born with his hand shriveled up. And they watched him whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. Isn't that horrible? There's a poor soul hurting. And they know Jesus never lets anyone go by that needs help. They already have Jesus figured out. If someone needed help, Jesus is going to help them. And then they're, they're glad now because this is their chance to accuse him. They're going to call that work. They're going to say, you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath day. Jesus, that's your work. You go around healing people. That's your work. You can't do it on the Sabbath day. Whatever you do on other days, you can't do on the Sabbath day. But sure enough, true to his great love uh, for everyone, verse 3 says, And he said unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. So in other words, Jesus is making sure that everyone sees what Jesus is going to do. He wants them to see him break the Sabbath in their definition so that he can teach a lesson about it. And he saith unto them, oh, here's another one of Jesus' great strengths. He just asked them a question and they can't answer it because it would make them look like fools. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil? To save life or to kill? So he gives them a choice. They don't want to make a choice. If they say it's lawful to save life, then that means it's okay for him to do it. But if they say, no, you got to kill, that means that they're total idiots. No one, how could they justify killing? But they held their peace. They didn't say nothing because they, they, he trapped them with his words. And when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand. Isn't that amazing? Jesus can say anything and it happens. Wow, what power. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored, whole as the other. Verse 6, And the Pharisees went forth, and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. And uh, the Herodians were the non-religious political people joining with the 
conservative, hypocritical religious people. And they decided they needed to try and kill Jesus. But Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea. And a great multitude from Galilee followed him and from Judea. So anyway, what Jesus taught on that Sabbath day was it's okay to do good. That's what he said. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day? What can I do on the Sabbath day? Whatever's good to do. If it's a good thing, you can do it. Well, that tells me something. Whatever is good to do on Monday, I can do on the Sabbath day. I remember when I went, just to show how Christians have abused the teaching about the Sabbath day. And they mix law with grace. When I was a student at BJU, I was shocked. One of my teachers was a former pastor. And he was talking about how he didn't want to do anything that offended other people in his congregation. So he was careful not to offend them. They didn't like people to mow their lawns on Sunday because that was the Christian Sabbath. That would be working on Sunday. And they were against that, and therefore he wouldn't do it. I think Jesus would have mowed his lawn on, on Sunday. That's what I think. Just to prove to people you can do anything that's good. First of all, Sunday's not the Sabbath. This guy's a teacher in a Christian college, and they're implying that Sunday's the Sabbath. And he's going to let people like the Pharisees determine what he does and doesn't do in order to keep everyone happy. They hated Jesus because he wouldn't keep the Sabbath according to their definition. Verse 8, And from Jerusalem and from Idumea and from beyond Jordan, and they about Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude, when they had heard what great things he did, came unto him. And he said to his disciples that a small ship should wait on him because of the multitude, lest they should throng him. For he had healed many insomuch that they pressed upon him for to touch him, as many as had plagues. And unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. And they straightly charged them, and he straightly charged them that they should not make him known. Interesting that Jesus did not want the evil spirits to proclaim who Jesus was. Did not want that. That's not God's will. God's will is for believers to proclaim who Jesus is. The great name is Jesus. It was first mentioned by an angel to Mary when she said that when the angel told Mary that she should call the, her new baby boy Jesus. And Jesus is a great name. It's the, it's the name that God has uplifted. Of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a name that divides people. There's power in that name. A lot of times we sing a song, there's power in the blood. I got news for you. There's power in the name of Jesus. His name saves from sin. His name takes people to heaven. His name convicts people of sin. Using his name in, the, in this world, if you're a believer, not if you're a demon. If you're a demon, don't do this. If you're a believer, give Jesus' name. Speak Jesus' name to people. Sometimes when I hand out gospel pamphlets, I like to say, Jesus loves you because I know there's power in the name. I want to speak the name. It's that name that God loves, the Father loves. He loves the name of Jesus. Remember when he spoke from heaven? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus said, he that confesses me before men, him will I confess before my father who is in heaven. Don't ever doubt the importance of God wanting you to use the name Jesus in the world, both to believers and unbelievers. We pray in the name of Jesus. There's no prayer valid now. You've got to pray in the name of Jesus, right? You either pray to the Father in the name of Jesus, 
Or you pray to Jesus, which is in the name of Jesus, since you're praying to him. No prayer is valid other than using the name of Jesus. What an important name, a powerful name, and yet the demons are, were told, don't you use it. Don't you talk about the Son of God. Only my believers, my children, my sheep, the ones that I've saved from sin, they know what my name means because they've been saved and because the word Jesus means Savior. That's what motivates us. He has saved us. We care about others and we hope they'll be saved. And we know it's the name Jesus. That's the matchless name, the wonderful name. The powerful name, the important name, the best name, the highest name. You know, a lot of times in the world, people make a name for themselves. They become a celebrity. Their name becomes known. And then, you know, instead of being looked at like anyone else, they're a celebrity. Wow, will you sign my paper? They never asked me to sign their papers. I'm a human being too. Why does no one ever ask me that? Oh, I'm not a celebrity. They have a name. No, they don't have a name. Jesus has the name. He has the great name. How much do you value the name Jesus? Oh, it's an important name. It's such a name that it was given to you to use, to honor the Savior, and to use it in this world that doesn't like his name. They remove his name. Even here in town, I was told two years ago, don't pray in the name of Jesus. Somebody came up to me after a prayer. And that's what they said to me. Oh, you can pray next time. But next time, do not pray in the name of Jesus. That's right. They'll do that. That's a thing in America. It's called uh, being not non-denominational. Non I don't know. It's being non-controversial. There are some people that don't believe in the name of Jesus. And they don't like hearing the name of Jesus. Therefore, in order to please everyone, don't use the name Jesus. Sorry. I think we'll do it God's way. We'll use the name of Jesus with honor and respect. I remember growing up, the only time I heard the name Jesus in my family was when someone hit their, hit their finger with a hammer or something like that. Then I heard it, but it wasn't in the context where it made me think anything devotional or spiritual. But now we get to sing the name of Jesus, right? A lot of our songs are the name of Jesus. Two of our songs this, uh, today were, had the name Jesus in the title. Jesus, the very thought of thee. Jesus paid it all. What a wonderful name. And well, next time we'll start in uh, Mark chapter 3 and verse 13. And it's going to start with Jesus listing the names, or the Bible listing the names of the 12 apostles. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the Bible. We thank, thank you for what you taught us about what the Sabbath day means and that the, the fact that it's not even in effect anymore because we're not under law, but under grace. Thank you so much that we can know the truth. Pray for the poor Christians who have gotten everything all mixed up by creating a be, by saying that Sunday's Sabbath and other foolish things that are not in the Bible, that keep the law going when it, the law is supposed to be replaced by your grace, for which we thank you, Lord. So we pray these things, Lord Jesus, in your name and for your sake. Amen.